John the Baptist is dead. Jesus hears the news. And he wants to mourn. He wants to grieve. He wants to pray. And so he withdraws himself to a place of solitude. By himself, he's going to pray. He's going to grieve. He's going to cry. He's going to figure out in God what the story is. He's going to get revelation if he doesn't have it already. And as he withdraws himself, a crowd hears that he's up on the mountain. And rather than going, bless Jesus, give him a space. <laughs> they go, ah, he's here. And the crowd rushes up to go and meet him. And you know what Jesus does? Get away from me, you evil, adulterous people. Woe to you for messing up my sleep. <laughs> no, he says, he, he, he says, he sees those people and he has compassion on them. Because they needed to be healed. They were broken. They were sick. And so what does Jesus do? He heals them. He prays for them. He blesses them. And Jesus' response to the problem isn't out of selfishness. It's out of giving. Even though in that time, Jesus was going through. His cousin was just killed. Let's use modern day language. For the gospel. This was a close family member. This was the, 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 the very same person that when Jesus first met, he was still in the womb, wing, and jumping up and down with joy. Or John the Baptist was jumping in joy when, gee, when he met Jesus. So this was a close relationship, and he's in this place of grieving. And he still has compassion for others and blesses others. I'm reminded of Rodney Howard Brown. When he lost his daughter. And he's this big miracle healer, and he's getting people out of wheelchairs and raising the dead and doing phenomenal miracles. He's got, I, I don't know how many people, it's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people saved, and their church is powerful, and they have four-hour meetings, and it's crazy. He's a crazy man, but a man of anointing. And he, when his daughter died, he said, Lord, I think I, I, it sounds ridiculous if I say this, so I might have it wrong, but I think he asked for a billion souls. He said, Lord, if she dies, I want a billion souls. I don't know what your theology on bartering with God is. But anyway, this man of God said, Lord, even though I'm going through this suffering, I want to see the kingdom manifest. That's what I'm living for. And so Jesus is in this position, seeing the suffering. He's going, personally, I'm hurting, but I'm going to bless these people. That's the context of the scripture I want to read for you this morning. And as we read it, I believe that God is going to take us out of limitations that we ourselves have found ourselves in either through habit or a lack of discipline or too much discipline in the wrong arena or just by natural circumstance we've just happened upon a limitation and we're going god we don't know what to do we don't know how to get out of this i don't know why i'm stuck in a rut i don't know where to go i don't know how to do this it's painful but i'm comfortable in the pain i can manage this pain but I need to get out of this. I know there's something on the other side, but I don't know how to get there. And so this morning, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to get to the other side. I'm going to get to the other side. I don't know how yet. I just by faith, I'm going to declare, I am going to get to the other side. Uh, let's bring up the first scripture, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 7, 5 verse 7, which we all know is a statement. For we walk, or in this context it says, for we live by faith, not by sight. For we live by faith, not by sight. You may not see the solution yet. But thank God, we don't live by what we see. We live by faith. And so it is not disingenuous you're not being a fraud when you by faith declare i'm going to get to the other side even though you don't know the solution yeah. why should you be limited by your side it's not how we live it's not how we walk and so we've given too much authority too much power too much control to those limitations on our lives, and we've called them impossible, and we've called them impossible, not because we don't, not because they, they're not real, they are real, but because we've been living by what we can see, not by what we can believe. And so the secret isn't to get rid of the barriers. The secret is to get rid of sight. Everyone get a knife now, and let's pluck out your eyes. 
Jesus said, better to have, enter heaven with one. No, get, stop relying on what you can see. We live by faith, not by sight. So if we bring up the next scripture, Matthew 14. So Jesus is grieving. People come to him. He has compassion on them. And he's ministering to them, obviously, throughout the day. Because the next verse says, As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place. There is a limitation on us. There is a barrier. There is a circumstance. There is a predicament we're in now. And because it's remote, and it's getting late, said, they said to Jesus, now they're giving their good managerial advice to the Creator. <laughs> this is the best the disciples can come up with in that circumstance. They can see the limitation. Oh, golden prize. Well done, everybody. You can see the problem. <laughs> everybody can see the problem. You don't get any awards for calling out the problem. When prophets are marching around going, you've got this problem and you've got that problem. Who cares? You don't need a prophetic gift to see a problem. A five-year-old can see the problem. No prizes for that. So now they've called out the problem. Now their solution by what they can see says, send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. We've got an answer, Jesus. Don't worry about it. How many times have we got an, said we've got an answer for Jesus? Jesus, here's the problem and here's the solution. Bless our solution, Lord. This is the very crowd that Jesus is wanting to bless. Out of that place of deep compassion, which is an emotion. It's more than emotion, but it's also an emotion. And out of that compassion that Jesus has for the crowd, these guys want to send them away. These are the people that Jesus is blessing in the place of his pain, in his processing. And they're saying, okay, just get them away. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I want these people here. This is great personal cost and sacrifice to me to bless these people. Are you trying to take them away? Because you see a limitation? And Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. Let's just stop there for a second. They're hungry. It's getting late. The boys provide a solution. And Jesus doesn't say that their solution is wrong. He says their designation or their description of the problem is wrong. They don't need to go away. They don't need to go away. He says, you, that's the key word here. Everybody say, turn to your neighbor and say, you, <laughs> you, you give them something to eat. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> now that's the real problem, isn't it? <laughs> now the problem has just exposed itself. The problem is not that it's late and it's difficult. It's not, the problem is not your boss. The problem is not your wife. The problem is not your, your prayer life. It's not the outside, outside circumstance of the things that you do. Those are not the limitations. Your bank manager calling you is not the problem. You are the problem. <laughs> you are the problem. <laughs> I always find it funny. There's an there's a old English TV show called The IT Crowd. And one of the running jokes is they're part of the IT department that fix the computers. And people would phone in and say, hey, my computer's not working. And... You never hear the person on the other side, but you always hear the IT professional. He always is saying, have you turned it off and on again? Have you turned it off and on again? <laughs> because the IT professional knows that 90% of the problems are fixed by the guy not plugging it in or not turning it on or not having it plugged in. And yet they come up with some fancy problems of it's a virus. It's this thing. It's you guys have done an update. It's always someone else's problem. And the IT professional knows, no, you're the problem. In the IT world, they call it a picnic. It says, problem in chair, not in computer. <laughs> so we, we're ET phoning home all the time saying, God, this is the problem. This is the problem. God knows it's a picnic. Jesus said, you give them something to eat. 
How many times has someone come to you and said, here's the problem. And they're trying to get you to move and make a decision and push you around. Yeah, a problem, 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 problem. Not the problem. <laughs> picnic, picnic. The worst thing you can do to someone who's panicked about something is have a picnic. Because <laughs> how, how come you're at rest? How come you're enjoying yourself? You shouldn't be. There's a problem. You need to learn how to have that fortitude as a Christian. Because there's people who will call out whatever CNN is saying, or whatever Fox is saying, or whatever this war is happening, or whatever that rumor is. And they'll call out, the Christians will start calling earthquakes over California for, I don't know how many years they've called that now, because California is so evil, and now earthquakes are going to rip. Christians are moving out of California because they're earthquake. You know, that's how people think. That's a lot of Christians. Not, we're not even talking about the world. That's how Christians think. They just see problem, 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 problem. If God was so worried about the problem, he would do a Genesis what is it, 11 or 8? He'd just flood the whole earth. If the problem was really that bad, he could just sort it out. The wonderful thing about that is anyone who walks not by sight, but by faith is declared righteous. And he'll tell you about that problem and he'll give you the solution for it. So don't worry about all the problems. A lot of problems you can focus on. Save the whale, save the elephant, save this, save that. Not all, not all of those are bad. Those are good things. But don't be driven by the problem. Don't allow the world and other Christians to push you around by simply just a need that needs to be solved. Because if you operate by what you can see, you're going to reinforce those very limitations. Because Jesus could see that it was getting late. He created the sun. And he could see that they were remote. He created that remote place. It was not a surprise to him. So like Jesus needed to be reminded of how to tell the time. <laughs> he created time. So they're calling out a problem and they're trying to remind Jesus of how to solve it. Just this, just this. Miles Monroe, who's a, uh, he died I think in the late 2000 and teens. Um, but he was a great preacher on leadership and entrepreneurship and just a wonderful I've, I haven't actually listened to a lot of his preachers, but I've seen a lot of his clips because the sound bites on uh, Facebook or IG or whatever are powerful. But I heard him some, say something recently where he said, people think that the greatest gift that man was given was the gift of sight. He said, a much greater gift than the gift of sight is the gift of vision. Wow. And when I saw that, <laughs> he says, because sight is limited by what your eyes can see. Vision is only limited by what your heart can imagine. Jesus wasn't limited by what the disciples could see. And so when they provided a wonderful, clever, managerial decision or option to Jesus, he didn't even recognize what they were saying. He wasn't limited by the solution that they were trying to solve. The problem they were trying to solve. And so in his heart, he could see, he could envision the abundance of heaven. And there was so much abundance, although in the natural it seemed crazy, from the place he was living, it was just an obvious natural solution. You give them something to eat. I can see cattle on a thousand hills. I can see my father creating. Didn't you guys uh, get drunk at the wedding? Uh, some Christians would get angry with that. Didn't you guys have a sip of wine at the wedding where I turned water into wine? There's a supernatural abundance that was available that Jesus was living from that the disciples weren't witnessing because they were operating by the eyeballs, not by their heart. Miles Monroe says, He is always suspicious of his eyes because his eyes are the greatest enemy of his vision. You'll always settle and dilute what God has given you in your heart by what you can see. He says, because the eyes see the present and they can see the past. But the heart sees the boundless, limitless potential in the future. In fact, the eyes can make the past and the present look much worse than it is. The heart can make the past and the present look much better than it is. Yeah. When you have a redeemed vision on the process that God 
called you through. Even those pains can be something you thank God for in a genuine way. Because from destiny's perspective, he brought you through difficulties. And you can thank him for those. If you just operate by your eyes, you call that whole process evil. If you operate by your heart, you can call those horrible processes holy. Because God's redeemed them in your heart. Romans 8, 28, God turns around all those things that were meant for your harm. He turns them around for your good. Even the things in the past. Miles Monroe says, entrepreneurs are often called crazy out there. Visionaries are often talked about as mavericks or loonies or how did those guys come up with this? And the reason they are is because they can see what others can't see. And so he says the trick for these sort of people, these entrepreneurs who have a vision, is to define and clarify so clearly what they can see so others can start to see it. When God gives you a vision, number one, I would advise, don't be so quick to tell other people what God's vision for your life is. Because the second you articulate that, people who have been limited and put in a place of boundary of circumstance and past hurt and pain and haven't operated by vision but just by sight, they will start to articulate all the problems to you and dilute and then out of a good place, like Jesus' disciples, give you advice. See, wisdom is found in a multitude of counselors. Experience is the best teacher. It's bull. It's absolute bull. It can be true, but it can also be false. Because what happens if the best experiences you've ever had are all wrong or all limited? And someone comes along with a brand new plan that completely, not just slightly diminishes those past experiences, but completely overwhelms them with a whole new realm of possibilities. All of those people will go, well, that's not possible. You can't do that. That's illegal. You shouldn't be. And this person just. I think of Elon Musk when he uh, started to produce electric vehicles. Electric vehicles were laughed at. They were scoffed at. There was a famous TV show in the UK called Top Gear. When they first got a Tesla in, they complained about it and said it was useless and this was wrong and that was wrong. And actually what it turns out in the background, allegedly, they were like not using it the right way and they were tweaking things in the wrong way to make it look as bad as possible. And this TV show had a lot of clout and whatever they said, People in the UK followed. It turns out now every car company is trying to make electric vehicles. Because that loony bin, Elon Musk, saw something that others didn't see. And now everyone's doing it. He completely, he didn't just beat the best petrol car by three seconds. He revolutionized the whole market. Because he saw something that others didn't see. Your eyes are the enemy of vision. Do not believe your eyes. Do not believe your experience. Sometimes your experience is good. Sometimes there is wisdom. Actually, most times there's a wisdom in a multitude of counselors. But sometimes that multitude of counselors is wrong. That's why you've got to operate by vision, not by what you can see. These disciples were giving good advice. Let the guys go home. They want to eat. Give them enough time so the shops are still open. 7-Eleven. They didn't have 7-Eleven in Israel. So it wasn't open 24-7. It closed at 6 p.m. and the sun's going down. Let them go. It's good advice, right? And there's a multitude of disciples giving Jesus this advice. I know not many people are going to like me saying that. Because sometimes we make stupid decisions. They just look downright wrong. <laughs> and we're saved by good advice. <laughs> Sometimes you need to march into battle with a sling and a stone, even though the king is telling you put the armor on. Sean, you're preaching rebellion. No, I'm preaching Bible. Who was Noah to build an ark? Who was he? There's no shipbuilders in Noah's time. Nobody was building boats. And here, this guy is just building this big, is it a tower? Is it a high rise? Is it, what, what is it? And he builds this big monstrosity 
And he's talking about water coming down from heaven. What? Water doesn't come from heaven at that time. Unprecedented. All the best advice would have advised Noah not to do it. And they sold him the materials. And they provided him cheap labor because they made money. But they didn't believe what he believed. So he was the only one who made it out. Don't be too quick to sell out on your vision because of what your eyes can see. If God gives you a vision, you follow that vision. I love what Andrew Womack says. He says, some of the best advice that mothers give their children is, if your friends jump off the cliff, would you jump off the cliff? He says, which is good advice, by the way. Don't go cliff jumping. Uh, I don't even go on roller coasters. I just, don't, I just think there's some 16-year-old guy who's just doing this for minimum wage, and he's the one who's responsible for tightening the bolt. I'm going to put my life in his hands. No, thank you. I'm not going to do it. Some guy folds up a parachute in a special way, and then he jumps out of a plane. Are you suicidal? <laughs> and now that little bit of material is going to catch you with a little bit of string on the end? You're crazy. I'm not going to do that. Thank you very much. So I am risk averse. If your friends jump off the cliff, you got to jump off the cliff. Andrew Womack says, if God told me to jump off the cliff, I would jump off the cliff. When I first heard that, I thought, you stupid. You're so stupid. And then as I mailed over, because it offended me. And I love Andrew Womack. I think he's great. But it offended me. And because I was offended, I prayed about it. And God revealed to me, Sean, if I told you to jump off a cliff, would you jump off? No, of course not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> God will sometimes tell you to move, and it doesn't look like the wise thing to do in the natural. He'll tell you to leave, even though the best thing that you can see is to stay. Then where's all your wisdom talk and your wise counselors and your experience? And you've got to listen to the vision more than what you see. Otherwise you're going to end up in trouble. So then Jesus puts the responsibility on his disciples. He flips the tables. And says you give them something to eat. And because they're really good accountants. They said here we only have five loaves of bread. And two fish. Jesus are you stupid? Jesus are you blind? Can't you see? Because that's where they had all their trust. Yeah, Jesus could see. He created those loaves. He created fish. He created the biochemistry that keeps them afloat at just the right levels. And the plankton in the sea and the sun that would give them photosynthesis and the bacteria and the, the, the uh, whatever it is, algae to feed. He created the whole ecosystem. You think those two little fish escaped Jesus' vision? No. So here's what Jesus does. And I want you to look at this for your own life, with your limitations, where you think you've been stuck, where you think you have got financial problems or relational problems or spiritual problems or whatever it is, weight problems that you're trying to get through. Whatever limitation it is, it doesn't matter. If you're insecure, if you're angry all the time, you don't know how to get past, if you've got unforgiveness, if you've got a sin pattern, if you've got what, whatever the issue is, if you're looking at it by human discipline and human effort, and what you can see and what you can measure and past experience and what your psychologist says. If you only got that view of it, here's what you should do. Jesus said, bring it to me. Bring them to me. Whatever the issue is, bring it to him. I've noticed myself, the second Sammy gets sick, the first thing I do, open the cupboard door to get the Panadol, to get the cough syrup or whatever it is. The first thing I do in, when I encounter a problem for my little boy, who I love, is go to the medicine cabinet. That's not a good thing. We give him medicine. You should take medicine. You know, I'm not against medicine. What I'm against is operating by this before you operate by this. First thing should be Jesus. Here's a problem. Here's, I need a solution. So Jesus takes the little that they have. little few loaves, few little fish. Um, some Christians would want to turn this story into the loaves being the world's biggest pizza size and the fish being two big whales. Because then you can naturally explain why miracles don't happen today. And, uh, or there's only something special for Jesus that he could do. No, these were little loaves. Little fish would have fed one or two people or maybe a small family. Bring the problem to me. 
Now watch this. He directed or he ordered the people to sit down on the grass. Now some people will say that Jesus' management produced the miracle. It did not. Jesus' management did not produce the miracle. Except, I want you to focus on the word here. It says in this version, directed, I prefer the word ordered. When God created, what state was the earth in? It was chaos. And when he spoke his word, what he was doing was ordering. I am a big proponent of, I don't like management, I don't like accounting. I, I really hate those things uh, <laughs> because I find them so stuffy. And the librarian is just a very difficult person. And I'm like, get something done positive and then order it after the fact. And yet, Jesus didn't produce the miracle until he had everyone ordered. God didn't create outside of order. So when he spoke, what was he doing? He was putting things in sequence and in balances and in ratios. Water isn't just whatever water wants to be. It's one oxygen and two hydrogens. That's what water is. If you change that chemical makeup, you make poison. If you put two oxygens and two hydrogens, you make hydrogen peroxide. That's a poison. Don't drink that. So God creates by order, he takes something that's dysfunctional and limited and broken and orders it. That's why he, that's all healing is, is God ordering. When God made your legs, he made them a specific design. He didn't make them to be full of pain and, and discomfort and um, some sort of perverted growth where things are skewed and wrong and broken. But when he ordered it, it was perfect. So when you break your leg or you get in a car accident or something's wrong, the only reason you have any authority to command healing is because it's out of order. And so when you're ordering, you're ordering back into alignment of the way that God called it. And so I've got to be very careful when I speak about management and ordering and man, you know, accounting, because actually that is creation. Creation is order. When things come out of order, they come out of the natural creation that God created. That's exactly what the devil did. Satan fell because he tried to change the order. God's not the boss anymore. I am. Boom. Fall out of heaven. And then he tried to wreak havoc on the earth. And the earth came under frustration because it was disordered. So he ordered the people to sit down on the grass. And then look at this. He took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven. And everybody say with me, gave thanks. Gave thanks. Turn to your neighbor and say, give thanks. Give thanks with the grateful. Um, what was Jesus thanking God for? What was God thanking God for? Five loaves and two fish. 5,000 people, it tells us right at the end. 5,000 men, which could be 10, 15,000 people. We don't know. Let's just say 5,000 people. He gave thanks for five loaves and two fish. 5,000 people. He gives thanks for a meal or two. He needs 5,000 meals. Jesus gave thanks for one when he needed 5,000. He gave thanks for one when he needed 5,000. You may need $5,000 at the end of the month. Are you giving God thanks for $1? Or are you complaining about the 4,999? You need to give thanks to God for the one. Let me, I've said the story before, but when I first came to Hong Kong, God told me I needed a rest, I needed a honeymoon, I needed a holiday. I was working very hard. And when I came here, it was like a fresh start. It was a, a moment that I didn't have a huge amount of responsibility. And I didn't have a huge out, um, outgoings. And so God told me I needed a rest. Within two weeks, I already had jobs lined up. <laughs> and I was on the way to one of the jobs. And God said to me, but Sean, I told you to rest. But God, God, here's the problem. Here's the limitation. Here's the thing. And he didn't answer me. 
When God doesn't answer you, now let me be careful what I say. There's too many variations of that. And I've spent half an hour qualifying. God didn't answer me, but I knew what that meant. That meant, I've told you already, boy, listen. Okay. So I went there because I was honoring my word to a human, <laughs> dishonoring the word to my father. And, and it's shameful, really. But uh, I finished the hour of whatever I was teaching. And then after the hour, I said, I'm so sorry. And they were paying me such good money. And it was ridiculous that I was turning it down. But that's what God told me to do. And so I said to them, I'm so sorry, I'm not going to be able to teach again. And they were like, but why not? We love the lesson. And, you know, is it not enough money? And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> and I just said, sorry, I can't do this and had to leave. I didn't make it super spiritual, but we all know what I was doing and it was wrong. And so thank God for grace, because in the old covenant, I should have been struck down with lightning. A uh, lion should have come out of the forest and eaten me. Really, that should have what happened. There's prophets in the old covenant where God told them to do something. They didn't do it. And a lion came out and ate him. A prophet. Delivering the real word of God with real miracles and manifestations. Lion comes out and eats him. And then the lion stands there next to a donkey looking at his dead body. Thank God for grace. So I'm in this position of rest. I really was enjoying it. It wasn't like difficult rest. I was really enjoying it. But I felt a responsibility and obligation to fulfill visuals what I can see with my eyes. And God wasn't talking about eyes. He was talking about vision to me. And I had very special times in that first six months where God took me on literally step by step on physical journeys and told me things about my future in here in Hong Kong, about my life, that are playing out to this very day. And if I was off busy working for a little bit of money to answer physical requirements, I would have missed the destiny and the vision to what he was calling me to. So in obedience, I'm poor. <laughs> I don't have money. And so one day at the end of the six-month process, I'm walking along and say, God, I need money. God, here's my problem. I, I've learned, and I don't do this all very well all the time, but I've learned, don't provide the solution. Just give God the problem. Give it to me. And so I said, God, I'm going to need some money. I need money. And as the words finished from my lips, I look, I was walking through town here in Saikung, and I was walking... And there was a dollar on the floor. And I picked up the dollar and said, God, I'm going to need more than this. <laughs> and I heard God laughing. And uh, that made my life. And you know that dollar today is a witness to me and hopefully a witness to you yeah. too. I thank God for that dollar. Yeah. We just paid for a very expensive operation for Bonnie. Didn't blink an eyelid. Do you know why I could pay for that operation? And have the best care and one of the best doctors in the world for this specific thing. Do you know why we could do that? Because God ordered my steps. I didn't offer him solutions. I bought him the problem. And when I picked up the one, I thanked him. I wonder how many times I've missed out on blessing. Because I just wasn't willing to begin the process with thanks. We get a little elbow tweak. Oh God, oh God, ah! The other half of us is perfect. Our breathing is great. We can think clearly. And we've got one little problem. We don't thank God for the 4,999, but we complain about the one. Thank him. Thank him for one. Thank him for two. You can't make your rent. Thank him for the five bucks you have in your pocket. That person is being difficult to you and you don't know what the issue is. Thank God for the relationships that you do have. Thank him for the little. Because when you thank him for the little, he takes you into a process of problems turning into solutions. But when you don't thank him, you don't enter that process. It's not like the solution doesn't exist. You just can't see it. So thank him. I want to give you this. Bring up Psalms 100. I know everyone will know the psalm. At least you'll hear it. You would have heard it in worship services. Shout. For joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Here's the key. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. The very perimeter of encountering God is thankfulness. Your thankfulness does not earn his goodness. 
He is good independent of your thanks. He is enduring independent of what you do or don't do. But the way that you begin the process, you enter into his presence, is by thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. I love, I love the word thanksgiving over thanks because thanksgiving means you're giving him thanks. There's something generous about thanks. You don't need to thank people, but when you say thank you, so I, whenever I go to 7-Eleven and I get my Coke or whatever I'm getting from the little shops, I always look the person in the eye and say, thank you. Because most of the time it's just religion. They don't look, they're just doing their work. And I always try not to slow them down and slow people behind. I'm not a pest. But I'll take a second and I'll look at them and I'll say, thank you. And I'll teach my boy, say thank you to the lady. Thank you. Give thanks. Next time you will order food at the restaurant, thank the person. You don't have to tip them. But I recommend tipping them um, because it gi is giving something to give them value, to, to tell them well done, to thank them. There's something that's good for you when you give, when you say thank you. So that's how you encounter your God is by thankful. That's why most worship, worship services begin with joyful, happy, thanking God for his goodness. It's not because... That's someone just picked up a formula. Now we have to do that to be holy. No, no. It's because that's how you enter his courts. Thank him. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. That's about boasting about God's goodness. Look how good my God is. Thank you, God. And give thanks to him and praise his name. I want to read that again in a different version. Lift up our great shout of joy to the Lord. Go ahead and do it. Everyone, everywhere. As you serve him, be glad and worship him. Sing your way into, into his presence with joy. Don't you love that? Sing your way into his presence with joy. I've been teaching Sammy. I'll say to him, Sammy, say thank you. Thank you, Baba. And I'm like, no, you don't. Thank you, Baba. Like, I want his tone. I want his attitude to be upright, shoulders back. When he says thank you, he's like, I have to say thank you because Sean told me on Sunday, thank you, God. That's not thankful. You're just religious. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone do that now. Put your shoulder back. Put your chest down and go, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Susan, you don't want to say thank you. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. No, I know you're a very thankful person. There's something about your posture when you encounter whoever, but especially with God. There's something about your posture. There's something about bowing down low. I, sometimes I feel like people just do it religiously, but there's something powerful in a service where there's such an anointing and people get down and worship. Have you ever been in a service like that? It's, it's, it's very humbling. You don't even need a relationship with God to feel humbled because there's an atmosphere that comes. You can be a complete unbeliever. People start to bow down low. You feel reverence. You feel fear. You just want to worship. Your posture is powerful. Sometimes we get too comfortable as sons, we go, well, I'm a son, I can just lounge about. No, you are a son, and you'll always be a son, independent of your behavior. But there's a process that you begin when you get dressed up in the suit. Because dad's taking you to the fancy restaurant to teach you to eat with a knife and a fork, or in Hong Kong, with the fancy chopsticks. And I don't know how to use chopsticks, so the peanuts fly everywhere. But there's, there's something here that too many people are laughing. Uh, <laughs> you've seen too many guailos struggle, right? And sweat, and they go red. Something about your posture as a son that develops a process in your life. Thank you, God. That's why I put our hands up. You put your hands up. Well, God doesn't need my hands up. Yeah, you're right. He doesn't. You need your hands up. Because some, when you put your hands up, you can't put your hands up like this. It's like it's pathetic. You know it's pathetic internally. When you put your hands up, your shoulders come back. Thank you. Thank you. Just put your hands up and say, thank you, Father. Thank you. You feel that strength that comes? Thank you. Thank you, got solutions to my problem. I can't see them, but thank you that you got solutions. Lord, I don't know how you're going to reach 4,999, but I thank you for the one. Thank you. Thank you. As you sing your way into his presence with joy, realize what it really means. We have the privilege of worshiping the Lord. Oh God, how powerful is that? You have the privilege to worship. In the old covenant, you were distant. In the new covenant, he brought you near. You now have a privilege to worship. You weren't always allowed to worship. David was really naughty. 
when the Ark of the Covenant came back into Israel, that he put it in just any old tent. He didn't bring it back to Moses' tent. He put it into a tent and opened up all the four corners and let dirty foreigners like us come in. He shouldn't have done that. And yet that's exactly what he did. A house of prayer for all nations. That very same mantra was spoken by Jesus when he kicked over tables. He said, my father is a house of prayer for just the Jews, for all nations. We have the privilege of worshiping. Sometimes I undervalue the fact that I'm included. I shouldn't have been. By Jewish law, I am not. But by the law of love, I am included. I have the privilege of worshiping. Sometimes I go, ah, oh, it's just worship. It's just songs. Oh, that person played the key wrong, or they sang flat, or I'm not going to worship. How <laughs> dare I? How <laughs> dare I? It is a privilege to worship. For he is our creator, and we belong to him. We are the people of his pleasure. Watch this. You can pass through the open, uh, the open gates with the password of praise. Everyone say password of praise. Password. I love the fact that this is a contradiction. It's an open gate. Why do you need a password? And yet, <laughs> it's an open gate with a password. What's the password to the open gate? Praise. Pray. I boast in my God's goodness. I boast how strong he is, how much he loves me, that I belong to him. I have a privilege to worship. Come right into his presence with thanksgiving. Come bring your thank offering, that's praise, to him. And affectionately bless his beautiful name. Wow, I love that. I could read Psalms 100. Just read that over. If you don't know what to do in three minutes and you don't know how to pray, the th go read Psalms 100. You'll just feel so invigorated. Back to Matthew 14. So Jesus says, bring it to me. He ordered the people to sit down on the grass, getting re ready to create now. He's getting ready to, to manifest a miracle. The Spirit hovered over the water. Now He's going to speak into that chaos, but there's, there's a predicament. There's a situation that God is ready to bless, and He's going to order now. He takes the fish and the loaves, looks up to heaven. He gives thanks. He gives the secret password to the open gate. That was always open over Jesus. He gives the password. And he breaks the loaves. Notice that word, breaks the loaves. Figuratively, he was breaking the limitation of what one loaf could do. So he thanked God for one loaf. And then he said, I'm not going to be limited by one. And he breaks into the 4,999. Watch this now. This is very, very powerful. Jesus is never functioning at one level. He's always working in multiple dimensions. He's talking to the crowd. He's talking to Pharisees. He's talking to disciples. He gives the same parable, but they all get something different out. And then the fourth dimension is us. He's also talking to us. He's giving us a little wink outside of the page going, you guys read this. You're going to get something else from this because you have, these guys don't know about the new covenant yet. And so in this dimension of breaking the limitations, he does not give the loaves to the people. Why? <laughs> he does not give the loaves to the people. He then gives the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people. I wonder when Jesus said to the disciples, you give them something to eat. Was he condemning them or was he prophesying? Because they did give them something to eat. But look at where their source was from. Their source wasn't from what they could see. It was from what Jesus could envision. And so when he said, you give them something to eat, he didn't say it in that time. He said, you're going to give them something to eat. There was a joy and a glint. When God says to you, I want you to go and pray for so-and-so, or you get the phone call that says, so-and-so sick, will you come in with me to pray for? <laughs> that little fear breath, that lack of oxygen, I wonder in that, is God ever giving you a wink to say, I've got something for you to give to that person. You can't give them anything, but I got something that I'm going to give you that you can give them. How many doors have we closed on the opportunities because we haven't seen 
what he's going to give us to give them. The pressure, as Rob says, the pressure is not on you. The pressure is on the word, Jesus. The pressure is on him. You, as Patrick says, you are just the middleman. You don't have to conjure up 4,999 loaves. You just have to be in a place of thanksgiving. You have to take the problem to Jesus, not the solution. Let him give you the solution. And then you say, oh, thank you for the blessing. Here you go. Takes the pressure off you. You just become a conduit for the blessing. Otherwise, if you don't have that mindset, never pray for anyone. Because I don't care who you are, how many magic cards you can pull out of the deck. What little fancy tricks you can have the ace of spades manifest over there. Whatever trickery you're using to make that happen, you're never going to make a leg go straight. You're never going to get someone out of a wheelchair. And absolutely no one will be redeemed by whatever blood you drip out of your wrist. Nothing. Nothing. You can drip all the blood out. No one's getting saved by you. When you understand that it's him that's the source, you can pray for anything. You can give anything a go. Because you're not operating by this. You're operating by your vision. Gave the disciples the bread, and then the disciples gave it to the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces that were left over. How can you be left, the leftover, the thing that people are too full to eat after a day of just receiving from Jesus? After a full day of that, they must have been starving. Five loaves, 5,000 people fed, and 12 baskets left over. That to me is amazing. Now, they ate more than 12 baskets full, but the fact that Jesus has such abundance that there's even leftovers is phenomenal. Don't waste. Be safe. Conservative. There's, there's good understanding in that sometimes. A lot of the time. Sometimes that is just an excuse for stinginess because you can't see the provision. And so your conservative, I'm not trying to be wasteful, sometimes will limit feeding 5,000 because you won't give over the five loaves because there's not enough. That's why giving is so powerful. Giving is very, very powerful. Some people believe in tithe. Some people don't believe in tithing. If I'm really, really honest, I don't know what I believe about it. What I do know is this. I have seen people preach tithing religiously and I disagree with it. You are not going to be cursed if you don't tithe. That's just, that's old covenant. That doesn't happen in the new covenant. And God is not a lottery machine that if you put a tithe in, he owes you now. That's not how it works. You don't owe you anything. You owe death and judgment. That's what you owed. Don't call. <laughs> don't call the accountant to settle the accounts. What I do know is God is a generous God. And sometimes he's generous independent of you. And sometimes he's inviting you into giving over a few loaves so you can come into an abundance where the leftovers are more than you started with. The, le the dregs, the spillover is more than what you started with. And that begins by giving over the five loaves. Not because God owes you, but there's an abundance in his presence. And if you are so focused on what you can see, God will often call you to give over what you can see. So he can use what you can't see. I remember in Ireland, I've said the story before, but I had two euros left to get on the little, little train that they had thing there to get to church. And I had two euros left. I know that because it was the only change I had in my pocket. And as I was walking to church at the end, other end of the train line, I went to the ATM to try and draw out 10 bucks. And I didn't have it. I had nothing left. But I knew that Sunday... I just knew I had to get to church. You ever had that? You just know you, you got to get there. I get to church. I sit down. I'm having a cup of coffee, which was nice because I didn't have coffee at home. And I just had no money. <laughs> there were times in Ireland I didn't eat for two weeks. I didn't have food for two weeks. And I ate every single night. Because someone invited me for dinner. And this thing happened. And that thing happened. And then, uh, uh, uh. It's like I've never eaten so much in my life. And I had nothing. But God had me in a place. And I was just, it was just... You don't always have to live like that. Please, Lord, please. <laughs> but it's very exciting when that happens. Very, very exciting. Because you just know God's, you get the phone call, you just know. I prayed one afternoon. I said, Lord, I need money. He said, how much do you need? I said, I need 200 euro a week. 
Not three hours later, a friend phoned me out of the blue. I had no, he didn't, I didn't know he was doing this job. I didn't know that there was even a position in the job. I had no idea. He didn't know that I didn't have money because I never tell people, oh, I don't have, I, I will never tell you. If I'm sick, I won't tell you that I'm sick most of the time. I just, my problem is my problem, not your problem. And there's problems with that problem, but anyway. <laughs> so he didn't know I didn't, I, so he phoned me out of the blue. Now his context of me was I worked in a bank, which I just quit. So I had no job, but his vision of me, what he could see was, Sean doesn't need money. He wears a suit and tie and goes banking. He phones me out of the blue and says, Sean, I, I don't know, do, do you need a job? I just felt God tell me you need a job. I said, um, what is it? He said, it's, it's like washing dishes and waitering. It's one dollar. I need 5,000. It's one dollar? That's, but I just prayed. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, how much does it pay? He says, 200 euro a week. <laughs> and I just, put, I'm like, okay, God, this is weird. This is weird. Because he didn't know. What did I do? I thank God. Started that job. You know, it was a miserable job. It wasn't fun. How many of people love to wash dishes? There's a few crazies, but not fun to wash dishes. And yet when I thank God and I put my effort in and I was disciplined, I arrived early and I did all the things that my parents taught me to do that are good things. And I learned and I asked questions. Hold on, how do you do this? How do you do that? Always sidling up to, to people with more experience saying, how do I do it? Why, why does this work? Why do you do this thing? And you're just diligent. You know, Christians should be the most diligent, disciplined people. We're not. And be honest about that, like we were this morning. But that's, sons should be able to produce the most. Sometimes we use our sonship as an excuse to not produce and be, have a bad attitude. No, God disciplines the sons he loves. And through that job, I was earning much more than I used to earn at the bank. Much more. Because they gave me all the expensive gig gigs that were difficult to get to, that no one else wanted. And because I knew how to be thankful, they put me in positions in front of presidents, prime ministers, high-level doctors, famous musicians. I went to parties where they had famous bands all playing together on the stage at the time with F1 drivers and a president in the corner. And Europe's richest man over there that I was pouring his wine for. Me, little nobody, wow. started out doing what? What did you do, Sean? I washed dishes. I thank God for the one. Thank God for the one. And as I thanked him for the one, he trained me and developed me and put me in positions. Some of us are not wet prepared to wash dishes because we think it's below us. Oh, well. Dying on the cross was below him. He didn't need to. Coming to this dirty, stinking world, born in a major, born as a sacrifice. If he doesn't get to complain and he thanks and he praises for two, two fish and five loaves, how dare I not thank for my stupid little job that doesn't pay that much? Let me wash these dishes. Ephesians 6, 7, I think, says, do everything as unto the Lord. That's not religion, that's heart. That's God, I don't like sweeping up, but I'm going to sweep up. My boss told me to do something. I don't want to do it. No one wants to do it. That's why he told me to do it. It's not in my job description. I'm not paid to do this. Thank you, God, that I have a job. You get insulted. Say, I don't know, how dare you insult me? Jesus was insulted. He was slapped around. He didn't deserve that. You don't deserve to be insulted. You take that insult and you say, Father, here's a problem. What do I do with this problem? Give me thanks. Give me the password to pray, Sean. The, the door's open, but give me the password to pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you. I praise your name. I boast in your goodness. And that person sees that you didn't respond negatively to the potential offense and you could have blown up and torn the whole ship down. Foolish woman tears her own house down. And you just respond with grace and mercy. And they go, why did you do that? And they come back to you. And they, why didn't you? You should have blown my head off. Why didn't you? I have a father who loves me. What's the problem? What's your problem? I've got someone I can bring that problem to. Amen. Not super spiritual. You, it doesn't involve you going to the mountaintop to bring down the principalities and powers. We're talking about Christianity 101. We're talking about simple day-to-day -day thankfulness, diligence, 
discipline. We're talking about Jesus, the great restaurateur. All the story focuses on feeding the 5,000. He just, he got people out of wheelchairs. He got them healed and he's having compassion. That's not what the story, fo- the story's focusing on how great his cooking skills are. It's 101. And they could have gone and done the natural thing. They could have. It's what the disciples decided. But Jesus is living in a different dimension, from a different dimension. And God's calling you to live from a different dimension. You don't need to be up on a stage. You don't need to be in some other country. You don't need to be over there. You don't need to know 15 other scriptures. You know where you need to be? Exactly where you are. But not from this. From this. I've only got five loaves. You've got five loaves? Luxury. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. It's just a holiness in thanking him. By Heather. Heather's going to um, Karis graduation and Patrick is, and others are graduating today. So very special. We'll honor them next week. Thank him. Thank him. You know, I could have been ungrateful this morning because there's less people. Because of the very Karis thing. I'm saying, God, thank you that there are people here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And then the next verse is there were 5,000 in number. Father, I thank you that I get to thank you. Thank you that I get to thank you. Thank you that I have the privilege of worshiping you. Thank you that you brought me close. And that the way that I come closer to you, when you bring me close, is not to beg, to borrow, to steal, to fight. But Lord, that I get to thank you. I thank you. I praise your name. I boast in your goodness. Not on my strength, but in your goodness. Thank you. The joy of approaching you is my strength. Thank you, Lord, that no matter what I'm going through, if I'm going through sickness, if I'm going through pain, if my husband hates me, my children despise me, if my parents are controlling, if my boss is berating me, if I haven't got a job, Lord, I thank you that even in all of those horrible circumstances, I can still thank you for something. I thank you for the little that I have. I don't complain about the lot that I don't have. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, I thank you that you can lift me out of a circumstance even though I'm in the circumstance because you raise my vision from what I can see in my, with my eyeballs to what I can see with my heart. Lord, I thank you that you didn't take Moses to the other side by some sort of magic carpet. You didn't just lift them up and put them on the other side. That you actually made them march through the waters. That they could hear the Egyptians behind them. That you made them see that the enemy was defeated behind them. That at daybreak, they turned around and saw the Egyptians swallowed up. Thank you, Lord, that you're not looking by magic to bring about an end to our circumstance. But by the miraculous working power, you are looking to turn it around at a speed we can see it. Thank you, Father, that we have testimonies upon testimonies of your goodness in our lives. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, whilst we know that evil things do not come from you. Bad things do not come from you, for you are good. We do thank you through those circumstances. We thank you through the value of the shadow of death. We thank you that you can turn everything around. I just feel the Holy Spirit lifting. I want to say lifting our eyes, but he's not using our eyes. (laughs) He's shifting the apparatus by which we measure from our eyes to our hearts. And those very things that you've been complaining about for months, God is saying, don't look at them at the way you've always looked at them. Don't rely on your experience. I'm shifting you to see this differently because you're looking at it from my dimension, from my perspective. Bring it to me. I can hear the command in Jesus' voice. Bring it to me. Bring it to me. Not as a reprimand, but as a loving embrace of his problem-solving ability. Bring it to me. Bring it to me. Some of us are, are so good at crying and complaining and explaining the problem. But, but it's not, oh, oh, but God, you don't. Oh. And God's not listening to your complaint. He's saying, just bring it to me. Bring it to me. Bring it to me. Just 
Just bring it to Him. Feel the Holy Spirit just moving. He's shifting hearts this morning. He's shifting burdens. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For some of us, the key to our miracle is not the problem. It's the 99% that is working and is focusing on that. Just thanking God that 99% is working. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, I repent of wanting to be over there when you've called me to be over here. And making that the biggest issue in my life. I'm trying to rush ahead to be over there, 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 there. I've got to be there, I've got to be there, I've got to be there. No, you've got to be here. You've got to bring it to me. Bring it to me. And then he'll bring you there in his right time. Now, how long it would have taken those people to go and find the shops? They wouldn't have had enough food in those shops. You think the disciples knew all of the iterations of that supermarket would have run out of bread really quickly, 15,000 people. But that was their solution. Jesus knew that. I just feel like we have an opportunity to put down the weaponry we've been fighting with to try and solve the problem. God's saying, just put it down. Just come to me. You don't know that, that the thing that you're fighting with won't work. It's not going to get you where you need to get to. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Lord. I thank you for that strength, <laughs> that trusting, that walking by faith, not by sight. I thank you for that strength of faith. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Can you just say with me, thank you? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that strength.